This video is about bloating. It's designed as a tool to help us understand perhaps what's causing a problem of bloating with you. I first recognize that bloating is a complex phenomena with possible multiple causes. Frequently, it is just due to impaired emptying of gas in the intestine. Either this mechanical, neurological, or physiological mechanisms are involved. There can be a psychological component. In the emergency room for many years, I would see people with intense chest pain and get x-rays. I noted they had a big bubble of air in their stomach, and I did some reading. I found out it is common for people to swallow air. It is common particularly when they're anxious. Moreover, when a person is eating or drinking and talking at the same time, it's very easy to swallow air, particularly if there's some dysfunction of the lower esophageal sphincter, the muscle at the base of the swallowing tube that can keep air from going into the stomach. Overproduction of gas is a less common cause of bloating than other causes, but this can be due to a malabsorption syndrome and a dietary uh, relationship that we can go over. So I recommend going through a formal checklist to understand why you have a problem with bloating, and we'll understand through that if you have multiple causes or a single cause. This short checklist includes swallowing, and most common, as I said, is in an anxious or busy day, you might find that you're swallowing air, and if you have a tendency to talk and eat at the same time or talk and drink at the same time, this is very easy to happen. If you have a history of esophageal reflux disease or, or acid indigestion, this is, makes it even more likely. Drinking carbonated beverages can be contributory or causal. I mean, this just by eliminating carbonated beverages, frequently a person's bloating problem goes away. Malabsorption of sugars and alcohols has been known for quite some time. When you pass, uh, when a food passes through your small intestine and is not absorbed there, going to the large intestine, the microbiome, the bio, the bacteria that live in our gut ferment this. Um, they generally turn the energy into short chain fatty acids, which are absorbed as fat that are needed. It's very good use of food. The most common malabsorption syndromes are lactose malabsorption. Lactose is the main sugar in milk and milk products. Fructose malabsorption is from mostly from inulin, which is a polymer of fructose found in many fruits, particularly apple, garlic, and onion are high in fructose. High fructose corn syrup can obviously be a burden. Sorbitol is a common sweetener used throughout Europe and in chewing gum. You'll notice some people, when they chew gum, they basically have bloating problems because the sugar is not absorbed in the small intestine, goes to the colon, for, fermented there, makes, makes gas. After we go through the short list, I would recommend keeping a food journal if that doesn't enlighten us and show you what's going on. As I mentioned, mention, you should record whether there's carbonated beverages involved, whether you're having to have a rush, stressful life and eating, talking at the same time, drinking, talking at the same time. Also, how you sleep and insight into acid reflux problems if there are certain foods that are particularly bad. Also, what medications you're taking. Lactose intolerance and fructose malabsorption are really subsets of FODMAPs or fermentable oligodimonosaturides and polyols. What that all means is sugars that are one, two, or up to 10 sugar residues hooked together as they go into your intestine if the right enzymes are not on the surface of the intestine to break those down to simple sugar for absorption, they will move into the colon and be fermented. The presence of those enzymes is usually genetically determined to some degree and you may have a deficiency of them transiently after a viral infection or a gastroenteritis perhaps. Probiotics can be introduced and alter the bacteria fermenting capacity. So some people benefit from the use of probiotics to alleviate some of the bloating from FODMAPs. Different bacteria will produce different products from the sugars. And sometimes the products produced that make the oils that we need to absorb, these short chain fatty acids, just enhance our nourishment and our vitality, whether the other ones are discomforting. Sensitivities to different foods, including gluten, 
not the more extreme sensitivity to specific enzymes like the transglutaminase, but general sensitivities to protein and gluten, barley, rye can be contributory. Celiac disease is the term used for the more uh, targeted autoimmune response to specific enzymes in the small colon, in the small intestine. Celiac disease, or extreme gluten intolerance, is an autoimmune disease to particular enzymes in gluten uh, that cause the intestinal architecture to be varied of the small intestine. Resistant starch includes starch that is not thoroughly cooked. And the other thing is looking for histamine-rich foods in the diet. These can be contributory if they cause a swelling phenomena in the intestine, which you know alters our absorption. Some disease states are particularly noting, noteworthy, dyspepsia or acid reflux, sometimes a gastritis due to excessive use of alcohol or the use of alcohol with ibuprofen or other will result in bloating. Disruption of the diaphragm, the main muscle we use in breathing at the point where the esophageal sphincter, the muscles contributing to anchoring the esophagus, this can be a problem. Sometimes a person will have a paralyzed diaphragm on one side due to a nerve damage. This can result in problems with bloating because the esophagus does not keep air out when it should. This muscle is not a tight muscle at the sphincter. It's more of an architecture of how things are tethered. Bulimia and anorexia, unfortunately, can cause damage to the esophagus contributing to this. H. pylori is the common found bacteria that results in acid uh, ulcers or ulcers in the stomach. Gastroparesis is a condition of slowing of moving food through the intestine. Gastroparesis is a common side effect of poorly treated or poorly managed diabetes. There are other causes of it. As I mentioned, the microbiome, the actual bacteria that inhabit our large intestine, sometimes moves to our small intestine in bacterial overgrowth syndrome, which can contribute to bloating as well as normally food would be absorbed in the small intestine. Instead, bacteria ferment it there. This sometimes has to be diagnosed by doing uh, colonoscopy. There are other ways to uh, evaluate it. It's generally a referral to the gastroenterologist to diagnose that. Irritable bowel disease of the diarrhea or constipation type, both can be contributory to bloating and bloating can be an accompanying part of this, very common. It is important that we work you up to understand if you have a more constipation type or diarrhea type and to eliminate other you know, known causes in your diet that might be contributing to this. Mechanical, physiological, or neurological based constipation can contribute to bloating. So good supplements to know about. Bino is over the counter as a tablet form. It's an alpha galactosidase. Um, it's an enzyme that helps us metabolize the sugars in certain beans and vegetables. And it can be taken with, with the meal and help break these uh, sugars down so that they don't reach the large intestine of the bacteria where they're fermented. I feel L-carnitine has some benefit in some individuals. Clearly, if a person's L-carnitine depleted, which is essential for using fat energy, their muscles and their intestine may suffer. So this is not a, an expensive thing to try as a supplement to see if it makes a difference. Cymethicone is extraordinarily effective for the short-term management of gas. It tends to alleviate gas pains in minutes as opposed to over hours over a long strategic plan. A trial of lipase pancreas amylase enzymes in the event that we suspect a pancreatic insufficiency or that pancreas is not making substantial enzymes, particularly the lipase and pancreas, or there's a problem with the amylase, uh, these may be very beneficial and they're prescription medications um, and we'll have to discuss them particularly if we've eliminated other causes. More food considerations. Um, seeds have uh, the neurotransmitter serotonin in them, part of nature causing your gut to contract more and expel the seeds, probably a means of uh, helping the seeds be eliminated before they are fully digested so that they could be spread, part of nature allowing a plant to have a larger likelihood to exist. 
Foods that are absorbed easily in the small intestine um, provide good calories without fermentable problems. For instance, if you eat plain rice, it will absorb rapidly in the small intestine, not make the colon, there should not be any gas. On the other hand, there are great problems of having sugar and starch-rich diets because they're, they are lacking in fat-soluble antioxidants. And in the long run, they promote heart disease, uh, accelerate aging, put a person at risk for cancers, and even could contribute to autoimmune disease. Lactose intolerance is very common after a viral gastroenteritis or antibiotic use and is usually transient. So when we'll experience bloating for several weeks, this can be shortened in time by using probiotics during the use of the antibiotics and particularly afterwards. And as I mentioned, getting a list of histamine-rich foods and seeing if these things make it worse is a very wise thing. These can include red wine, fish, um, other beef jerky, other things. It is not a bad idea to try a restriction diet in the event that the bloating is a continuous problem. Getting away from, from gluten and casein and soy proteins, the proteins that are most likely causing immune reactivity or interfacing with our immune system causing more complications, is a good idea. It will take several weeks or months before you notice a significant change. It's worth knowing a little bit about gluten, the protein that is in wheat, barley, and rye. Glutenin is part of the gluten complex. Glutenin is in wheat, and gliadin is a prolamin in wheat. Mm -hmm. Other cereals have other prolamins. Those need to be looked at if you're eating things like corn and sorghum and oats. Casein is a milk protein that has some similarities to uh, gluten in the sense that there's histone rich segments structurally it's somewhat similar and probably there's a crossover antigenically or by the immune system recognition of these two things soy protein also is I've seen as a problem in people that when they've eliminated it, they've done much better besides the considerations we made about nutrition probiotics and antibiotics some cures or partial benefits can be found in conjugated linolenic acids. You can get these at health food stores at six grams a day as a trial, particularly for irritable bowel or more severe ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease can benefit from conjugated linolenic acids. And you will probably need a referral to a gastroenterologist if we suspect an irritable bowel problem or an ulcerative colitis and inflammatory bowel disease uh, as well. They may perform a hydrogen methane gas test to understand which sugars are being fermented. This is an overview slide of the hydrogen methane gas test. And basically, uh, once given some uh, challenge of uh, sugar, and then we monitor the amount of gas produced as you breathe out um, over a period of time, two or three hours, maybe every 30 minutes or 15 minutes, depending upon the test. And this test for interpretation, there is some variability. So therefore, it's not done immediately because it has some limitations in how we can interpret it. This is something the gastroenterologist will do if we can't get an understanding of your bloating. So in conclusions, I hope you do a food journal. If, we ha if you haven't concluded the causes of the bloating from the analysis, it's great if a patient comes in with these things done first, because then I'll know we'll need a referral to the gastroenterologist, which I would gladly do. And I may have picked up some more information and I may have been able to, or I could, sometimes I can recognize if there's an underlying other disease that's contributory to this that we need to talk about. As I mentioned, psychological factors can be a huge part. And that has to do with all kinds of the complexity of just making gas in public and things like this, particularly as a child's young and vulnerable to impressions of what's good or bad. Very good.